Good morning, everybody. Uh, Bruce Miller here again at Oakwood Cemetery along with our filmographer, uh, Robin Simonton, the director of the cemetery, uh, here for another virtual tour. Um, I hope you've had a chance to look at some of our earlier tours. Uh, I think they've been generally upbeat. We did uh, teachers, we've done some romances. Um, and today we're going to change tack a little bit. Perhaps it's appropriate that it's a gloomier day because we've got a gloomier subject. We are going to talk about crime. Crime is represented in Oakwood in, in perpetrators, in victims, and in enforcers. And in fact, we thought that uh, since we were doing this today, it would be an opportunity to honor Wally Police. See, I'm in, I'm in blue today. Um, Raleigh Police, without them, we would have a lot more crime stories to tell you. But um, we do want to uh, uh, keep police in mind as we do our tales today. Very quick bit of history about the police force. I think like most early towns, Raleigh depended on citizens, a night watch, to keep track of what was going on at night. Volunteers were assigned to a certain part of town, perhaps certain blocks, certain streets. That evolved into paid constables, and it wasn't until about the 1850s, apparently, that we got a police force that looks sort of like the police force we know today, uh, in some ways. Um, of course, that was when we got our first mayor, so you can see the bureaucratizing of the city government is reflected in the police force, too. Now, even then, in the late 19th century, police officer positions were often patronage jobs. That is, your political faction, if it was in office, you might get a job with them. Uh, even uh, uh, Thomas Alderson, whom you're going to meet in just a moment, apparently lost his job at least twice, not because of any deficiency in his performance, but because different factions came in, and so he had a sort of a sabbatical. Let's call it a sabbatical. Uh, anyway, um, we have great respect for Raleigh Police, and we want to keep them in mind that today as we go through what our photographer calls, instead of crime and punishment, uh, Mike Palco has suggested crime and interment. So, our topic today. And I want to start with my favorite cop. That is T. Barton Alderson, or Thomas uh, Alderson. Robin is panning in on his simple stone. Alderson probably, I keep calling him Thomas, he probably preferred Barton, judging by his stone. He did not come to Raleigh from Maryland to become a police officer. When he came to Raleigh from Maryland after the Civil War, he worked for the um, uh, Raleigh and Gaston Railroad for a time. And then he became a volunteer fireman, and I suspect that's what gave him the idea that public service might be a way that he could uh, uh, make a living here in town. And he joined the police force in 1891, and he stayed with it, off and on in a way, into his 70s. Um, and when you read the newspapers of the day, Alderson's name pops up all the time, doing things that cops do. He would break up fights, he would confront slashers, he would chase down robbers. It's a constant, a constant uh, string of those stories, him doing his job. But I think there are two, two quick uh, events that show A, the nature of the man, and B, the respect that folks had for him. First one in 1905 during the uh, state fair, town was packed with people from out of town here for the fair. Evening came along uh, uh, one evening, uh, packing Union Station, which used to be down on Nash Square. Uh, the building is still there, it's not a station anymore, but at the time people were waiting there for trains to take them home after a day at the fair. And all of a sudden, in the men's waiting room, two men start firing pistols at each other, apparently a wager or some sort of debt gone wrong. Uh, I, I, I don't recall what the immediate cause of it was. Uh, and in fact, a bystander is killed. Well, you can imagine what's going on in that waiting room that's packed with people. Everybody wants to unpack, so they head for the door. And the women next door in the women's waiting room 
they see what's going on and they all race out. So this huge mob of people, I guess, proceeding into Nash Square. Lots and lots of people coming out. Who's going in? Thomas Alderson. He's going in. He apprehends one of the shooters. Uh, the other is caught later on uh, by citizens. But I think the bravery of, of the man uh, is not in question. The other incident is far different than that, but shows another aspect of this man's character, I think. Um, guests at the governor's mansion complain that some of their personal belongings are missing. With the police department, please send someone down to investigate. Who did they choose to go to the governor's mansion, probably some influential people involved, to represent the police force and resolve this problem? They chose Alderson. Alderson goes down, investigates, finds out that the nursemaid, one of the child care ladies, uh, was guilty in taking some of the guests' personal belongings. Solved the mystery. Not a big case. My point being, he's the one they chose to do it. And I think that says something, something about the man. He retired from the police force. In a bit of irony, I thought his last duty station as a cop was down at Union Station, where he had chased down that uh, uh, shooter in 1905. Uh, and the last we see of, of uh, Alderson, he's doing newspaper ads for, uh, he's doing endorsements, I should say, for health products, that is, patent medicines. And I think probably a good representative because people had a great deal of faith and confidence in the guy. T. Barton Alderson. Uh, not every police officer like Alderson was fortunate enough to retire. Uh, we've crossed Maple Avenue between Linden Lawn section over to the uh, forest section, named for um, a longtime superintendent of Oakwood Cemetery. Uh, to visit the grave of Thomas Crabtree. Thomas Crabtree joined the police force as a young man, high respected, highly respected fellow, didn't drink, didn't curse, so it was said. He and his wife Mary lived with their four boys on Boylan Avenue, sort of a all-American healthy family. Uh, it happened in 1922 that a uh, young man not quite so healthy, one might say. Uh, a young white teenager, 19 years old, named Charles Klutz, K-L-U-T-T-Z, Charles Boots Klutz, um, hired an African-American to drive him around uh, downtown Raleigh to make certain stops over town so that he, Klutz, could visit relatives and friends. Um, <clears throat> Uh, George Williams was the black man and he dutifully drove Klutz around and after over an hour of this uh, Klutz told him that he wanted to go to Apex apparently to visit his sister or some other relative. Well this was beyond the original agreement I guess and uh, George resisted um, at, at which point Klutz pulls out a 45 pistol and threatens him. Well, I think uh, uh, <laughs> Williams headed for Apex along Hillsborough Street and stopped for water, either for the car or for themselves, uh, at a gas station at Glenwood that used to stand anyway at Glenwood and Hillsborough Street. And Williams got out of the car and was able to flag down or at least signal to a passing patrolman, which happened to be Officer Crabtree. Crabtree stops, walks over, and apparently he knew Klutz, and he walks up to him, Klutz in the back seat, and said, have you had a little too much to drink, uh, Boots? At which point Boots takes his 45 and puts two or three bullets into Officer Crabtree. Crabtree falls to the ground. He, um, in fact, he tries his best to climb under the car so that he can be out of the sight of, uh, of, uh, of Klutz. But by now, Klutz is behind the wheel 
and drives over Crabtree. Uh, clearly Crabtree um, is mortally injured and winds up at Rex Hospital. Meanwhile, Klutz uh, takes the car, goes on down the street to Maiden Lane. You probably know Maiden Lane, a short street right across from NC State now, and it's there the two other police officers uh, apprehend him. Apparently, Klutz trying to reload his 45 wounds himself in the arm. Um, so Klutz is arrested and he'll be charged with murder. Now the case gets very interesting because the state assumes that Klutz is a natural first degree murder charge, which means in those days anyway, execution. In fact, uh, an ele the electric chair. However, difficulties emerge and this becomes a real issue in newspapers, not just in Raleigh, all over the state. Everybody almost daily seems to follow this case. What is the state going to do about charging Boots Klutz for this killing? Uh, per the problem is that Klutz was in a railroading accident a little while before and had a leg amputated as a result. And during the course of this process of losing his leg, he'd been put on drugs and became an addict. Not only was he an addict, he was an alcoholic. And so he was likely on the influence of drugs, under the influence of alcohol, when he killed uh, the officer, uh, which meant that the state would have a very difficult time uh, lodging a first degree murder charge, especially since Klutz was described as uh, intellectually impaired didn't know what he was doing. And in fact, finally, after several months of bargaining, <laughs> the defense agrees that a secondary degree murder charge, no, no death penalty, they would agree to that, and he was charged with the second degree murder and got the full punishment for it, as, 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 a, as rigid a punishment as could be given for that charge, 30 years in prison. Um, uh, Crabtree died at Rex Hospital, his wife was with him and some friends, and the city took up a collection form, largely led by the Briggs family and other prominent families, took up a collection and gathered a large amount of money to go into a trust fund for uh, Mary Crabtree and the boys. Now, I, I tried to follow uh, Klutz to find out what happened to him. He apparently died I don't know if he spent 30 years in jail. He died of lung cancer in Greensboro in 1971. He was a, a linotype operator at the time, which, is, which makes me think maybe he wasn't mentally impaired at all. But, um, and he's buried in Salisbury, North Carolina. Anyway, uh, Thomas Crabtree gave us all. We're over in the Beechwood section now, um, and we have another death to talk about. Uh, and this one, again, just like a young uh, Officer Crabtree, shocked Raleigh. This shocked Raleigh because of the nat uh, a, a, a woman dies, uh, because of her stature, what she did for the city, um, because of the violence of the crime and because of the sheer greed that was the motivating uh, factor behind it. Uh, the victim that we're going to talk about is May Hill Davis Heim, H-I-G-H-A-M. Uh, she, the wife of John Heim, who was buried uh, next to her, uh, he died first of natural causes. He was the uh, local head of the uh, Woolworth store quite a wealthy man. They lived in Hayes Barton off of Carroll Drive. It must have been a sizable uh, estate. They called it Woodside. And uh, they actually raised chickens there as a hobby, I think, more than anything. They certainly didn't do it for a living, but they produced prize eggs, eggs known for their smoothness and lovely shape. <laughs> so they got some good publicity for that. Uh, Ms. Heim, uh, it had gone to St. Mary's. She had been an instructor at the blind school. And after her husband's death, she became very, very active in social work in, uh, in Raleigh. If there was a social organization involving women, she was a part of it. In fact, she was probably the head of it. 
She headed the Raleigh Women's Club. She was the president of the Raleigh Women's Club for uh, two terms. She was with the Daughters of the American Revolution. She was with the UDC. She was with garden clubs. You name it, she was there in the newspaper all the time. The other thing she did as a community service, uh, during World War II now, we're into the 1940s, uh, she would allow or invite soldiers who were on leave from nearby military bases to uh, weekend at her house while they were in Raleigh, give them a place to stay. Uh, and I think probably in retrospect, a lot of uh, people in Raleigh shook their heads and said, well, that was sure a mistake. Because in fact, it was an ex-Marine who was a cousin of hers, who uh, was with the, uh, at the house for a time. Um, his name was Harry Harrison. Uh, he was from Scotland Neck, a prominent family in Scotland Neck, and uh, they were linked uh, somehow along the, uh, as, as their relatives. Um, he, uh, she had loaned him money to start an insurance business. They were tied together in various ways. But uh, one night, in fact, it was Easter Monday, uh, 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 the neighbor called the fire department, this is in 1945, and said that flames were shooting out of the Heim house. So the fire department immediately shows up. This is 1230 in the morning. They get the fire uh, out, but they discover the body of Ms. Himes just inside the front door. Uh, dead and partially burned. Uh, it was clear very quickly though that it, she did not die from fire because her uh, skull had been fractured clearly by, she was hit by with a heavy object, beaten, beaten badly. And in what to my mind was a remarkable piece of police work, uh, they identified very quickly, perhaps they had information from neighbors, that Harry Harrison was the man they probably wanted to ask about this. And lo and behold, it seems within hours, at least to read the papers, a little uncertain, they arrest Harry uh, driving his car at Rocky Mount. And lo and behold, when they pull him over, they find uh, Ms. Himes' jewelry beside him in the front seat, and he is wearing her wristwatch which was valued at $1,000 in 1945. So that was an expensive piece of jewelry indeed. He denied any violence. Uh, he said that it had been a gift, that they were gifts given to him by Ms. Heim. Um, but it's clear, it became clear anyway, that he killed her. He's very nonchalant about it through his whole trial, that he had killed her and tried to burn down the house to destroy any evidence of the crime. Uh, again, uh, uh, shocked uh, Raleigh. I honestly don't know why in this case, uh, unlike the earlier one we talked about with Boots Klutz, I don't know why this wasn't a first degree murder charge. He was charged with murder in the second degree and he too, like Boots Klutz, received the full 30 years uh, in prison and I have not tracked him to see if he actually served it, but uh, I suspect served a big part of it given the horror that the state of North Carolina, and I suppose a lot of other people, uh, had about this particular case. All right, we are in the Hex section now, um, just left Beechwood, and we're going to talk about a crime. Nobody dies, but a lot of people get hurt, and hurt badly. This is what I call the It's a Wonderful Life uh, story. Uh, pretty close to that Jimmy Stewart movie in, in many ways uh, because it involves a bank and a bank failure. Um, the bank in question was State National Bank. After the Civil War, there were three nationally chartered banks in, in Raleigh, and they were important uh, because they provided um, capital for the state of North Carolina, the city of Raleigh, to rebuild but very important. There were other banks too that weren't national banks. National, of course, suggested security to a lot of people. Now, one of those banks was State National Bank, and that was founded by this man. You can read the stone. John Griffith Williams, a New Yorker, uh, came south as a young man, 
uh, founded State National Bank, very important to the city, and very important, it turns out, to Oakwood Cemetery. Why? Because John Williams was on the RCA, the Raleigh Cemetery Association uh, Board of Directors, and if you wanted to buy a share of the RCA, remember it's a, to this day a publicly held uh, corporation, um, you could buy the shares through State National Bank. Very important, uh, not just to, uh, to the citizens of the city of Raleigh, but certainly to Oakwood Cemetery too. Now John Williams dies and his will specifies that the control of the bank, at least for a while, is to be in the hands of his wife. She's here, a local girl, Miriam Carson, uh, Miriam Carson White Williams was her full name, and she became the president of the bank after John died, which made her the first female president of a national bank in the United States as testified by the Wells Fargo as Wells Fargo Bank historians. Anyway, the bank becomes a very uh, uh, family-run affair. I'm not sure you could even get away with it these days. We were going to spend more time with this, but in the interest of time, we'll cut out uh, some of the detail. Suffice it to say that by 1888, the board of directors of the bank consists of 10 people, including Miriam and nine others, four of whom were her family. Three were sons-in-law, they marry William's daughters, and the uh, fifth of the family on the board was her brother Samuel. Now many of the family is buried right here in the Williams plot, but there are two relatives who are not buried here. One of those is uh, uh, Charles E. Cross, who took over as president of the bank, he was a son-in-law, and Samuel White is not here, he being Miriam's uh, uh, brother, rather, who became the bank cashier. Now, a bank cashier is not a teller. A bank cashier is an officer of the bank who's in full charge of the what comes in and what goes out. Very important uh, position in the bank. So, Cross the president and Samuel White the cashier robbed the bank in March of 1888, tens of thousands of dollars. I've never gotten a final figure, but probably in today's currency it amounts to about two million dollars. Now keep in mind, in those days, there's no such thing as the FDIC. You put your money in the bank, your cash in the bank, to keep it because you thought the bank was secure, that it was safer in the bank than it was under your mattress at home. So if a bank gets robbed, they're taking your money, and there's not insurance provided by the government that's going to cover you. So, as in, it's a wonderful life. You remember all the people gather around uh, J uh, Jimmy Stewart's bank wanting their money back. Same thing happened in Raleigh. A, a, a mob on Fayetteville Street, the newspapers described as never having been seen before, <laughs> wanting their money back. The bank stood uh, in the 100 block of Fayetteville Street, and uh, Fayetteville Street is just jammed with people wanting their money. And it's, a, I should, shouldn't use the term amusing, uh, but on the first page of the newspapers of the day are little stories from all the other banks that say, it wasn't us, our money's good, your money's safe with us, don't run our, don't make a run on our bank. It's state national, they didn't point the finger at state national, but they wanted to be sure that they didn't experience a bank run too. Uh, so, a real calamity for people, the bank guaranteed, a guarantee I don't think they could ever hold, that you'd get $75 back for every hundred you deposited. Picture that. Every hundred dollars you put in the bank, you're only going to get 75 of it back. <clears throat> the two robbers, uh, Cross and White, fled to Canada by train, and they took with them a man named John Gibbs. John Gibbs was an African-American porter at the bank. Uh, I don't think he, I think he didn't go willingly as far as I could tell, and yet at one point at a stop along the way, when White and Cross get out to get something to eat, they leave him on the train sitting on top of a satchel full of cash. So I, I, I don't think he had a, a legitimate part in this, but nevertheless, the three of them wind up in Canada 
thinking that they're not going to be extradited, but in fact they were. They couldn't have crossed into Canada in the commission of a crime and expect not to be ex extradited. Uh, again, to make a longer story short, uh, the sheriff from uh, Raleigh, along with uh, Fabius Busby, a local attorney who was the uh, U.S. attorney for Eastern North Carolina, take the train to Canada, bring them back, and they're tried and convicted uh, of bank robbery. Uh, and then uh, two more people entered the story briefly, two people you've met if you've been with us on any tours. Let's go over and visit one. You may, re oh, you, you may remember Thomas Argo, uh, a prominent attorney. Uh, we did him uh, on at least one tour. Uh, he was a fellow with Argo's Folly, who was a house that he didn't finish because he'd lost his, uh, his wife. Uh, Thomas Argo at the time was the solicitor who tried the case. He prosecuted the case against the two men found guilty, but since the crime had involved Canada, there were issues of law that were much more complicated that could be handled just in a, in a Wake County courtroom. So in fact, this case made it all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, Thomas Argo uh, arguing um, on behalf of the state. And there's one other name that you might be interested in. And we've come uh, a little ways across the cemetery to finish up with another person. If you've been on our tours, you know. This is the marker for Dan Fowl, Governor Fowl, an attorney in Raleigh before he became governor. His house used to stand down where the Hotel Sir Walter was built. But uh, Dan Fowl became governor with the two men, the bank robbers, uh, assigned to the county uh, workhouse, the prison, if you will. And uh, Dan Fowl grants them a pardon. Um, we talked a lot about sentencing, and this is another one that surprises me. I don't know why, except that these families were, they functioned together in many ways, and I don't know if that played a part in it or not. Anyway, uh, neither Cross nor White, the bank robbers, are here in Oakwood, and perhaps there was a condition involved that they had to leave the same time. I have no idea. I just know that uh, they didn't spend too much time in the, in the workhouse. Okay, we have, uh, we're on our last uh, true crime tale, so to speak. Um, and we've come all the way over to the uh, eastern edge of the cemetery in the A section to do it. We're by a, a traffic road with noise. I hope that's not going to interfere with this story because this is perhaps, if you can have a favorite crime story, I don't know quite how to word that, this would be mine. This is a story involving uh, Willie or Wiley, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Willie is often pronounced Wiley in Raleigh, but uh, we'll, we'll call him Willie Mangum. Willie Mangum, another cop in the spirit of Crabtree, in the spirit of uh, Alderson. Now, he began as a young man, as a lineman for a utility company, and then <clears throat> changed. I think uh, he saw uh, uh, more of a future with the police department, and he joined the Raleigh police and became what must have been a dashing motorcycle cop. Uh, picture him in his uniform, and uh, I don't know if he wore a helmet, I doubt it, but uh, his uniform and his bike, and he did a great job, not only uh, solving speeding problems in Wake County, he had a reputation for it, but in going after bootleggers. They were a big target of Raleigh police in those days. Willie did very well as a policeman. In 1925, he was living not far from where we are. His house still stands. In fact, I think descendants still live in his house on Boundary Street that runs uh, near the northern edge of the cemetery. Uh, his wife, Hattie, is buried next to him here. 
They had five children, and life seemed good, I think, for the Mangums in 1925. And in 1925, something happens that is going to mark his life forever and we'll move somewhere else and tell you about it. All right, we're still in A section to uh, tell the next part of this tale. Uh, in November of 1925, I think just when things were looking very nice for the Mangum family, uh, into town rolls a gangster by the name of Slim Anderson. At least that's what uh, we think his name was. I swear, I think to this day, they're never quite certain that that was his name. People would be suggesting his name from around the country and uh, it would prove to be wrong. So anyway, Slim Anderson, Andy Anderson, known as Slim Anderson, came into town driving a car that had been stolen in Georgia. He parks the car in downtown Raleigh behind the ho Hotel Sir Walter and gets it serviced. And meanwhile, he walks into town to a men's store uh, which stood just off of Fayetteville Street where the Subway restaurant is now. I hope the Subway restaurant is still here. It was badly damaged during the rioting, but uh, I think it's still here. But that is the rough spot where King and Holdings haberdashery or men's store uh, held forth. And into the store walks Slim Anderson and orders a suit. Now there are four clerks in King's that at that time and they get to work on his suit and actually cut it and tailor it and fit him for it so he can wear it out. Apparently he wears it out of the store but before he goes he pulls a pistol out of his pocket, herds the four clerks into the back of the store and on his way out stops at the till and takes the business's money. Thinking, I suspect, that all he had to do now was walk back to his car with money and suit in hand and travel on to the next town. What he hadn't counted on was that he was going to be followed, not only followed, but chased through the streets of downtown Raleigh. Some of them, after a while, became policemen. And he went into a basement of a house that stood where the parking lot for the News Observer is now, right across from Nash Square. Now about this time, it appears that Willie Mango, as though by magic, appears on the scene. He's a take charge guy and he takes charge of the small group of police who now have Slim Anderson holed up in that basement. They go in, pistols drawn, and confront Slim Anderson who opens fire and shoots Willie Mangum right in the gut. Mangum goes down but the police who were with him open fire and spray Slim Anderson. He goes down. Both men go to Rex. It's not clear if either of them will survive. Uh, it so happens that Willie Mangum survived and uh, recuperated relatively quickly. However, Slim Anderson dies. The irony of this story is that Slim Anderson may have created more problems for people in Raleigh after his death than beforehand. So there's more to this story than meets the eye. Uh, before we leave, this is the grave of Frank Marshall King, who is the king in King and Holding, one of the four who was pushed to the back of the store after tailoring the suit for Slim Anderson. All right, we've moved up to uh, to, Magna, uh, to Magnolia Hill, uh, right along Oakwood Avenue. Uh, again, I hope the uh, car noise doesn't disrupt us here. Uh, this is the grave of Henry Jerome Brown. Uh, you know his name because he began uh, his work in Raleigh as a coffin maker and turned into an undertaker and is the he is the Brown in Brown Funeral Home or Brown Wind Funeral Home as it eventually became. Now remember at our last stop Slim Anderson dies. Well his, his being dead what do you do? You move him to a funeral home and the city apparently chose Brown uh, to move him to. Now in those days uh, the Brown Funeral Home was down on Salisbury Street 
at what's now the Death and Taxes restaurant. That's why it's called Death and Taxes, because they had a coffin shop there, and they later had a bank. Anyway, that is the Brown Funeral Home in 1925 when Slim Anderson dies, and that is where he goes, but with a special provision. Somebody along the line, either at Brown's or with the city, decides that it's okay if his body is displayed and allow the public to see it. This is a big deal. Remember what had happened, a shootout in downtown Raleigh was big news. This was exciting, uh, if you will, sort of horrifying. So they put the cadaver of Slim Anderson on display and the numbers suggest that as many as 3,000 people came to see Slim Anderson's body on the first day it was exhibited. Well, to the horror of city officials, they realized that a lot of those 3,000 people were kids. So they stopped the exhibit. They ended it. But at about the same time, the News and Observer publishes a picture of what amounts to Brown's death mask. And we actually have an audio visual for you. <laughs> this the visual. Because here it is. Here's the picture of Slim Anderson that appeared on the front page of the paper. I hope you can pick that up and see. Uh, not to make light of it at all, I don't. I, some of you out there may be old enough to remember the country rock star Jerry Lee Lewis. I always thought this is sort of the spitting image of Jerry Lee Lewis. Anyway, the exhibit stops, but you still have the question, how do we bury Slim Anderson? Let's go somewhere else and find out. All right, by coincidence, we didn't plan it this way. We're in the Anderson section. Now you remember when we last left uh, uh, Slim Anderson, uh, he had died at Rex Hospital and the question became uh, the method and location for his burial. Well, into the story steps a woman named Lucy Snakenberg. Now, Lucy was a, a very kind-hearted woman in Raleigh. She was a, a member of a family of tailors who were so renowned that Robin tells me that the door of the tailor shop is a part of the Museum of History's collection downtown. So anyway, a very uh, well-meaning woman. She tells the story that she was at Rex when Slim Anderson was dying and she had the opportunity to lean over his bed and hear some of his last words. And his last words were words of asking for forgiveness. He was so sorry for the life he'd led. He wished he had an opportunity to somehow right his wrongs. Would the world please forgive? You can imagine the sort of things she was hearing and the sort of things he was saying. So touched was she by his words that she wanted to offer him a spot in the family, the graveyard, in Oakwood Cemetery, which is where we are now. Well, when word got out about this, some people weren't happy, including some neighboring uh, uh, graves like the Marshalls just up the hill. But they weren't the only ones who were unhappy because look where the Snake and Bird plot is, right across from the office right at one of the main entryways into the cemetery itself. Uh, the board of directors of the cemetery had an emergency meeting to discuss the situation. Were they going to allow this hardened criminal who had tried his best to take the life of a Raleigh policeman to be buried at an entryway to Oakwood Cemetery? The answer was no. They would find a much more appropriate spot to put him, which they did. Let's see if we can find it. Okay, here we are uh, at the grave site for Slim Anderson. He finally found his final resting place. This is uh, the single grave site. It's along Oakwood Avenue to my right here. Um, and it's uh, in a way colloquially known as the pauper's field uh, for folks who would have trouble meeting the expense of a, of a grave in the regular area of the cemetery. But uh, many, if not most, of the graves here don't have markers. 
Uh, some do. Most just have the numbers including Slim's. In fact, Slim, I don't know if it's a comment on Slim or not, even his number is chipped. It's not, uh, it's not whole. May he rest in peace. However, that's not the end of the story. There is what you might say is a coda to this uh, unhappy symphony, and we will tell you what that is somewhere else. All right, we are back to your surprise, I'm sure, in section A, once again at the uh, Frank uh, King uh, grave site. You remember when uh, when uh, Slim Anderson came to town, one of his first stops was King and Holding, and this is where he got his suit and began his adventure that led to the shootout uh, a few minutes later. Um, as this thing winds down, and as the uh, uh, we get through the display of Slim Anderson's body, and we are resolving his uh, burial, uh, King and Holding, in true American fashion, are going to take advantage of all the publicity generated by Slim Anderson's visit to Raleigh. How do they take advantage of it? By running an ad, a large ad, in the News and Observer, and I've got a copy of it here, you see whose name is prominently displayed to get your attention. <laughs> but I, uh, I asked Robin to run this off because it's hard to read. I wanted, in the first place, I knew you wouldn't believe me if I just told you this happened. I wanted to show you, but I'm afraid you may not be able to read exactly what the ad says. So let me read it to you. It says, Slim Anderson used good judgment in picking clothes that are just a little different, just a little better, king and holding clothiers. Now, is that taking advantage of this situation or what? I hope their business boomed because they earned it. <laughs> anyway, I like this as you can't really laugh at this story, but it's a nice way to end on more of an upbeat note our uh, story about Raleigh uh, and some of our major crimes over the years. We hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.